potęga smaku. Pani profesor Izdydorz Domski. To wcale nie wymagało wielkiego charakteru. Nasza odmowa, niezgoda i upór. Mieliśmy odrobinę koniecznej odwagi, lecz w gruncie rzeczy była to sprawa smaku. Tak smaku, w którym są włókna duszy i chrząstki sumienia. Kto wie, gdyby nas lepiej i piękniej kuszono, słano kobiety różowe, płaskie jak opłatek lub fantastyczne twory z obrazów Hieronima Boscha, lecz piekło w tym czasie było byle jaki. Mokry dół, zaułek morderców, barak nazwany Pałacem Sprawiedliwości. Samogonny Mefisto w leninowskiej kurce posyłał w teren wnuczęta aurory chłopców o twarzach ziemniaczanych, bardzo brzydkie dziewczyny o czerwonych rękach. Zaisty ich retoryka była aż nazbyt parciana. Marek Tuliusz obracał się w grobie. Łańcuchy tautologii, parę pojęć jak cepy, dialektyka oprawców, żadnej dystynkcji w rozumowaniu, składnia pozbawiona urody koniunktywu. Tak więc estetyka może być pomocna w życiu, nie należy zaniedbywać nauki o pięknie. Zanim zgłosimy akces, trzeba pilnie badać kształt architektury, ryt bębnów i piszczałek, kolory oficjalne, nikczemny rytuał pogrzebów. Nasze oczy i uszy odmówiły posłuchu, książęta naszych zmysłów wybrały dumne wygnanie. To wcale nie wymagało wielkiego charakteru. Mieliśmy odrobinę niezbędnej odwagi, lecz w gruncie rzeczy była to sprawa smaku. Tak smaku, który każe wyjść, skrzywić się, wycedzić szyderstwo, choćby za to miał spaść bezcenny kapitel ciała, głowa. That was the power of taste by Zbigniew Herbert, read at an at a meeting at uh, Poznan University in 1984. And this recording, along with a selection of uh, poems by Zbigniew Herbert, was published by A5 Publishing House. My name is Dariusz Bugalski, and it's my honor to welcome you at uh, this uh, award ceremony for the International Zbigniew Herbert Literary Prize 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you at Teatr Polski in Warsaw as a very hospitable setting as usual and I want to welcome those of you who are watching elsewhere who were watching the live stream and on the Herbert Foundation website and culture.pl wherever we are we are here together to enjoy poetry and to celebrate poets allow me ladies and gentlemen to extend a very warm welcome to Katarzyna Herbert yes. And now I want to invite Maria Dziedusicka, the president of the Zbigniew Herbert Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, we're meeting in a exceptional year. The Polish Sejm, the Polish Parliament has, by a resolution, made 2018 the Zbigniew Herbert Year. The resolution expresses recognition for the great achievements of the artists and uh, the significance of his work. We need to appreciate uh, such uh, gestures of appreciation for a poet, especially by uh, a Polish parliament that voted unanimously. But as Madame Katarzyna Herbert, the founder of our foundation, says, Herbert should be read, first of all, and listened to, as we listened to him just now. We believe that the award, the 
International Zbigniew Herbert Literary Prize, which our foundation has been awarding for six years now, encourages and inspires people to read uh, poetry by Herbert and by the wonderful prize winners of the Herbert Prize. We believe that this inspiration is important, that it resonates not just in Poland, but around the world. The Herbert Prize is awarded with thanks to the support of many private individuals and institutions, and we're grateful to all of them. I would uh, particularly like to thank the strategic partner of uh, this year's prize, the Pezotu Foundation. I want to thank the Adam Mickiewicz Institute and especially thank its uh, director, Krzysztof Olenski, and uh, thank the whole team at culture.pl, thanks to whom this uh, ceremony is being streamed in real time around the world. The Embassy of Ireland is also uh, a partner at uh, this year's event, and I suppose you know why. I want to extend a very warm welcome to His Excellency Ambassador Gerald Keown and his staff. Your Excellency, welcome, Ambassador, and thank you for your support. I would cordially like to thank the management and the team at uh, Teatr Polski. We send our best regards to director Andrzej Severin, who is rehearsing for a new production. We want to thank uh, Traple Konarski Podrecki uh, Law Firm for their legal support. I want to thank the National Library for their cooperation, and I want to thank Polish Radio, our media partner. Ladies and gentlemen, in the inscription, Herbert wrote, there's a flame in me that thinks, and I hope that tonight will light that flame in all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maria Dziduszycka, and now Ryszard Krynicki, a poet, winner of the Zbigniew Herbert Prize three years ago, has selected three poems by Herbert and will now read them. Good evening. I will read uh, three poems by Zbigniew Herbert, one of which is very well known, and for me personally, it's one of his most important poems, but I believe one of the most important poems of the 20th century, and two lesser known poems that I found in manuscript and I published in Zbigniew, uh, po Zbigniew Herbert's Scattered Poems. Słowników opasłe encyklopedie, ale nie ma kto poradzić. Zbadano słońce, księżyc, gwiazdy, zgubiono mnie. Moja dusza odmawia pociechy wiedzy. Wędruje tedy nocą po drogach ojców. I oto miasteczko Bracław wśród czarnych słoneczników. To miejsce, które opuściliśmy, to miejsce, które krzyczy. Jest szabas. Jak zawsze w szabas ukazuje się nowe niebo. Szukam cię, rabi. Nie ma go tutaj, mówią Hasydzi. Jest w świecie Szaolu. Miał piękną śmierć, mówią Hasydzi. Bardzo piękną. Tak jakby przeszedł z jednego kąta do drugiego kąta. Cały czarny. W ręku miał torę płonącą. Szukam cię, rabi, za którym firmamentem ukryłeś mądre ucho. Boli mnie serce, rabi, mam kłopoty. Może by mi poradził, rabi Nachman, ale jak mam go znaleźć wśród tylu popiołów? Dekoracje snu. Zawsze miasta, ani śladu morza, ani lasu, zielonej polany, pustyni, tylko domy i skwery, zaułki i przedmieścia. Nieznośna mieszanina miast, Siena, przez którą przebiega ulica Piotrokowska, Londyn zmieszany z Rzymem. Nagle bez ostrzeżenia urywa się Tottenham Road 
i rozpoczyna się via dandolo, prowadząca pod górę. Zawsze hybrydy, a przecież latami torturowałem pamięć i ćwiczyłem oko, tak że mogę z pamięci rysować widziane przed laty kościoły, wieże i weduty miast. Być może sen mój cierpliwie wypomina moje zdrady, ucieczki, rwanie więzów, nie stało się uczuć. Albo po prostu mówi, że jestem wygnańcem, któremu odmówiony został dom w dolinie, zegar na wieży, wieczny czas, wspaniała ludzka przestrzeń, wieczny czas. Z nienapisanej teorii snów, pamięć Żana Amery. Oprawcy śpią spokojnie, sny mają różowe, poczciwi ludobójcy, którym już wybaczyła krótka ludzka pamięć, obcy i plemieńcy. Łagodny wiatr obraca kartki rodzinnych albumów, okna domu otwarte na sierpień, cień jabłoni w kwiatach, pod którą się zgromadził zacny ród. Bryczka dziadka, wyprawa do kościoła, pierwsza komunia, pierwszy uścisk matki, ognisko na polanie i niebo gwiaździste, bez znaków i tajemnic, bez apokalipsy. Więc śpią spokojnie, sny mają pożywne, pełne jadła, napojów, tłustych ciał kobiecych, z którymi gry miłosne w gąszczach zagajników. A na tym wszystkim płynie głos niezapomniany, Głos czysty jak źródło, niewinny jak echo o chłopcu, który spotkał różę na łące pośród wrzosów. Ci nie budzi widm ani koszmarów, dzwon pamięci powtarza wielkie odpuszczenie. Budzą się wcześnie rano, pełni woli mocy, starannie golą kupieckie policzki, resztę włosów układają jak wieniec laurowy pod wodą zapomnienia, która zmywa wszystko. Namydlają swe ciało mydłem marki Macbeth. Dlaczego sen, schronienie wszystkich ludzi, odmawia swojej łaski ofiarom przemocy? Dlaczego w nocy krwawią wśród czystej pościeli i wchodzą w swoje łóżka jak do sali tortur, jak do celi śmierci, jak w cień szubienicy? Przecież i oni mieli matkę i widzieli las, polanę, niebo, jabłoń w kwiatach, róże. Kto wygnał to wszystko za kamarków duszy, oni także przeżyli chwilę szczęścia. Więc dlaczego ich wycie budzi w nocy niewinnych domowników i zrywają się raz jeszcze do szalonej ucieczki, tłukąc głową o ścianę, a potem już nie śpią, wpatrzeni tempo w zegar, który niczego nie zmieni. Dzwon pamięci powtarza wielkie przerażenie. Dzwon pamięci bije niezmiennie na trwogę. Zaiste ciężko wyznać, oprawcy odnieśli zwycięstwo. Ofiary na całą wieczność życia są już pokonane. Więc muszą sami ułożyć się z tą karą bez winy, z blizną wstydu, odciskiem palców na policzku, Podłą wolą przeżycia, pokusą wybaczenia, a opowieść o piekle budzi już słuszny niesmak. Nie ma już teraz miejsca, gdzie by zanieść skargę. Niepojęte wyroki feruje Trybunał Snów. Dziękuję. Richard Trunicki read three poems by Zbigniew Herbert. Thank you very much. And now the composition of the jury of the International Herbert Literary Prize, Secretary Andrzej Franaszek and members Yuri Andruchowicz, Edward Hirsch, Michael Kruger, Mercedes Monmani, and Tomasz Różycki, whom I would now like to invite up on stage. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to announce on behalf of the entire jury 
that the winner of the International Zbigniew Herbert Literary Prize for 2018 is the Irish poet Noani Donkono. Uh, said, quoting another Irish poet, that she writes poems and she knows the words to all the Irish uh, songs because she cannot sing herself. She was uh, talking about her uncle, a storyteller, who had an incredible facility to express himself to speak in Irish and in English. He was a wonderful um, speaker and uh, a patron of pubs where he sang. She says he was a true poet, even though he never wrote a line of verse. Nolan Homel writes uh, poems in Gaelic, the Irish language. It is a matter of choice, though she was born in England, and when she first came to Ireland, she, first, she knew barely the words of a few songs, not understanding what they meant. She writes in Gaelic in spite of everything, in spite of the fact that in Ireland, emancipation from patriarchal culture or a, the rural tradition or the almighty uh, and oppressive uh, power of the Catholic Church uh, was uh, something she uh, saw hope in English. English was the language of modernity, the language of rock and roll and the media. And uh, Nihomel is a uh, part of a generation that wanted sex and drugs and rock and roll. And yet, Donnell writes in Gaelic, and in her poems we'll find uh, evocations, uh, references to the traditional theme of Irish poetry, Celtic mythology, and our Catholic religion, though conservatists uh, might not be, conservatives might not be pleased. One of her protagonists, uh, Fionula, or Nula for short, the uh, figure from the legend of the uh, children of Lear, who are uh, turned into swans for 900 years by a curse, says, and I quote the English translation, although our human voice remains to enchant the hearers, our mind, our sense, our sweet music, and even our Gaelic tongue remains. What would I not give to be free from the curse? Another um, protagonist character in her poems, uh, taken from Celtic mythology, is the mermaid's daughter uh, brushing her teeth in uh, the bathroom with a thick brush, uh, thinking how to express it properly to the psychiatrist, how to uh, talk about water using the vocabulary that's uh, not compatible. Another, word, another girl taken from a song about the land under the waves is employed by the richest businessman in all of Ireland, the Dark Master, to, uh, and uh, Paul Muldoon uh, translation, I've gone and hired myself out. Uh, not that he meddled with or molested me, for to tell you the truth, our relationship was always more akin to walking out or going to study. Noah Nihomel uh, no, writes Gaelic uh, just as well as uh, her English-speaking uh, colleagues write in English. She's a wonderful contemporary poet, and the curse of Gaelic uh, is no obstacle. Another poem begins as follows. I place my hope on the water in this little boat of the language, the way a body might put an infant in a basket then set the whole thing down by the edge of a river. Uh, hope is placed in language, a boat that might save it. According to uh, Josephus Flavius, the Jews in Egyptian uh, slavery had almost lost all hope of returning to their homeland, and then one of the priests uh, told Pharaoh that the signs uh, foretold that there was a child uh, who would destroy the power of Egypt. Pharaoh um, ordered the murder of all newly borns. Miriam, who had uh, just uh, had a baby, uh, placed it in a basket uh, to save it. We know the rest of the story. In uh, Nitomel's uh, poem, 
Uh, hope is like a baby. Uh, language is a boat, a crib, protection and a vehicle. But it's not hope. It's just a vehicle, an instrument, thanks to which hope can survive. Gaelic, the language of Ireland, is a minority language. It is a lesser, a small language that in its history had the misfortune of having an enormous uh, neighbor, this uh, giant of the English language. The Irish state is doing a lot to reanimate uh, the language, but since the state has to intervene, that means things aren't going very well, that things aren't as good as they should be. Besides, we know that often heads of state can harm language more than help it. Uh, everyday users of uh, Gaelic are number about 80,000 higher. It is used sporadically, occasionally, by about 7, uh, 700,000 people, I beg your pardon. The other um, uh, residents in Ireland speak uh, English, so it seems that uh, nearly, uh, barely 1% of the population speaks the uh, native language, which is more or less equal to the uh, number of people who read poetry. I think that belonging to a minority that upholds what seems to be a lost cause would be something that the beginning of Herbert would appreciate. But unlike the Irish uh, tongue, Irish poetry is one of the best known, best appreciated and best recognized uh, poetry in the world. The paradox is that uh, nearly most, that most of its poets uh, write English. We know um, Nolan Tunnel's uh, poetry uh, largely thanks to her wonderful English uh, translators, Irish poets. Uh, she was translated by Seamus Haney, Paul Muldoon, Derek Mahone, Michael Longley, Matt McGeekin and Sharon Carson. The uh, poems I quoted in Polish were beautifully translated by Jerzy Jarniewicz, who uh, translated them according to the English uh, translation. They were translated from the Gaelic into English by Paul Muldoon, whom the critics have called a perfect uh, translator of her poems. So it's a double translation. We know where it leads. It can lead to Chinese whispers. But uh, Robert Frost, uh, who was once asked the question which has no answer, what is poetry, said, poetry is what is lost in translation. But to all those who do not know, for all those uh, who uh, do not know Gaelic, a translation is all that they have, and since Anula's uh, poems read in Polish affect us uh, so much, even though they changed language uh, twice along the way, maybe poetry is something more. Despite all that is lost, for all that is lost, uh, there is something that survived, that we've gained, thanks to translators. And I think that you will be able to uh, hear that shortly, uh, so that the prayer of the traveler, Mr. Cogito, is... Um, Listen, heard, let me understand other people, other languages, other sufferings. Is it not the case that language is alive when uh, poetry is written in it? Not poetry that upholds the traditional values, national, religious, folk poetry, or linguistic or metaphysical poetry, but above all, good poetry. Uh, poetry that can stand up for itself in any language and in any translation, like the poetry of Nihomel. It's not lost in translation, it can be heard and seen. And we all belong to the 1% who speak a common language. Because poetry, as Yaroslav Mikoyevsky said last year at the award ceremony, is a language of community. Is there uh, a hope that uh, Nola Nigromel will save the Gaelic language? As long as people listen to and read poetry, yes, there is. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Tomasz Różycki. The prize is a statue uh, designed by Staroszek and Rycerski, architecci, the winner of the Zbigniew Herbert uh, Literary Prize for 2018 will receive a check for 50,000 American dollars and the uh, award uh, has been funded by the Pezetu Foundation, the strategic partner of this year's awards ceremony and now Let's ask Katarzyna Herbert and Dr. Grażyna Melanowicz, a 
member of the board of the Pesatu Foundation, the strategic partner of the International Herbert Lurie Prize to award the prize and say a few words. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Pesatu Foundation has once again supported the Zbigniew Herbert Foundation because an international literary prize, the Herbert Prize, is an exceptional honor. I have no doubt that the poetry of Zbigniew Herbert is part of world literature, not just Polish literature, and uh, Zbigniew Herbert is the greatest Polish uh, writer with a great moral and literary authority. He left behind a legacy, the universal message of fidelity to ideals, truth, and courage, artistic courage. On behalf of the Pesatu Foundation and my own, it is my pleasure and my honor to extend my uh, sincere congratulations to the winner of this year's uh, prize. Good evening and welcome. I'm very happy that uh, this year's award goes to uh, Nola, and I think it's something speaking of Herbert would have liked very much because he liked and admired Ireland and its culture and its poetry, Irish poetry. So thank you very much. I'm very happy. Congratulations, thank you very much, and now a few words. Thank you so much for this wonderful evening. I was a late reader. We lived in England where they used the phonic system. And I was just about reading at the age of five when I was farmed out to West Kerry, where there was the language change to Irish and also much more old fashioned teaching methods. And I was at least nine before I began to read. There were no children's books in the house, only medical books like The Lancet. So I joined the local library where I borrowed two annuals of comics which were just suitable for my level, but where to read them. The house was so cold. So I climbed into the hot press and of course fell asleep. Hours later I awoke to the hue and cry of the whole household looking for me. I could never remember where I had left the books. For this, I was banned from the library by the formidable librarian. So no more library books. In desperation, I got down a series of tomes from a top shelf left over from my grandfather. They were wonderful. The Teutonic myths and legends, the Celtic ones, Blahnet, the woman made from flowers, the Slavic ones, Perun and Horse and Strubog, the Indian myths and legends, the Japanese ones. I soaked it all up like a sponge. I was in my element. I can safely say that the only aesthetic experience to which I was exposed in my youth were the old Irish modal a cappella songs called Shan Nos that my father sung. I learned them mostly in the car during our frequent journeys home. In those days, there was a good three and a half hour journey by car, and my father sang to stop us small children from getting car sick as much as any other reason. 
His repertoire was the great classical songs of Munster, Our Rhine, Vora, and the Moon, which include the most extraordinary lines of beauty, of poetry imaginable, wedded to melodic lines of great beauty. Now, I'm going to try and sing. Why I'm a poet is because I know all the words and I know all the airs, but I don't have a good voice. So anyway. Fosn hu gan bo gan bunt gan a heart of spray a quitten pale let all the winter the hamar let the shame of galler do gan mest do a hachin hark mo chlef e kashal mo the lab of I love songs like that. <laughs> I tell you, I'm not a singer. I love the song like that, especially this a twiddly bit, I call it. It's um a quidl little the winter. Now, because it breaks all the the laws of prosody. You know, it shouldn't happen. Yet it does happen, and the musical air makes room for it. I could spend, and have spent, long hours just mulling over that particular line. I was lucky to grow up amongst a group of speakers who were not only Kaintori Dukish, native speakers, but were also amongst the even rarer category of Kaintori Maha, good speakers. This is the type of speaker for whom every single utterance is as elegant in its structure as in its meaning. They compose in the sequence of the musical phrase, not in the sequence of the metronome, to borrow Pound's famous phrase. An example. I remember going up to my Aunt May's house one day in winter after I had a very bad night without a wink of sleep because of the howling wind all night. My aunt explains to me that I have bad duchus. Now, duchus is a word that is almost impossible to translate, but for now, let us call it genetic propensity. The story goes um, that the fear of wind was so strong in the family that um, the, uh, one of the brothers way back, when he heard the wind rising, used to take his blanket and go out to the haggard and sleep in the stable under the cart on the principle that if the roof fell, the cart would save him. Just as we were in the middle of this discussion, her husband pipes up, Aren't you lucky that you are not aboard a ship in the middle of the great ocean? He could have made a much simpler and different sentence of it, but it was the euphony of the matter that was important to him. Another day I was sitting on a ditch, helping to bag potatoes with our neighbour, Mike Long, and we were looking out over Ventry Strand and the bay when he said he remembered the whole British Atlantic fleet coming into the bay in 1912. He and some friends of his went out to the ships in their vogues or curraghs with straps of mackerel and were rewarded with cigarettes in exchange. He knew the names of all the great dreadnoughts, the invincible, the indefatigable, the defense. Then he says, Be Erdson Lungan Gubetwa Shul on Gauna Shia Machashtachar and Drag Gandachasa Aluka. You could walk. Uh, into the strand uh, from the farthest ship out without wetting your feet. I was studying Irish at college at the time and immediately recognised the line as straight out of the late medieval Middle Irish text, the Battle of Rentry. Now these men were small farmers and had at most a few years schooling, sometimes for only a few months a year. But that didn't mean that they were unintelligent are not diligently interested in the language. They mostly frequented a pub whose host had three Irish dictionaries under the counter to help him referee amidst literary arguments about the use or misuse of words. As an adult, I was often corrected if I mispronounced a word or used it somehow out of context. A little bit of literary history now. 
My greatest literary hero heroes of all are the ancient monks who, having got the gift of literacy from the church through Latin, had the self-confidence and genuine bumptiousness to start writing Irish in it as early as the period from 500 AD onwards. In a recent article, I read that one of the most striking aspects of the encounter of Latin and the vernacular is that the Gaelic literature that came into being was not a minor literature, but one widely regarded as outstanding by comparison with other vernacular literatures of the time. Native literary tradition would not be to the fore in the same way again until the turn of the 20th century, and then mostly in English. Also striking is how early in the medieval period Ireland produced poetry and narrative literature of an exceptional quality in the vernacular, while it also de developed the vernacular as the medium for highly sophisticated legal, historical, and other genres. A new origin legend of the Irish began to coalesce in the early 7th century, which defined the nasio, the nation, in terms of descent from a common ancestor called meal, and the use of a shared language. I know we can make jokes about the Irish, and you're right to make them, everyone makes them, about we think we are such exceptionalists, and we are so special, and we make all these jokes ourselves. But even we can be taken aback by the audacity of the claim made for the Irish language in Orakep Nanakis, the primer of the poets, the main part of which has been dated to the very early Old Irish period before 700 AD. According to this, Phineas Farset, who had remained at Nimrod's tower when the peoples of Babel had dispersed, he was given the task of creating a new language out of all those already in existence, and what was best in every language and what was wisest and finest was cut out into Irish. With this enabling fiction, the local Gaelic literati set the Irish language above even the three lingue sacre, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. I love the men who did this. They are my first group of literary heroes. The second group to whom I am greatly beholden are the poets and scribes of the 18th century and the early 19th century, up to the time of the famine. They had barely survived the shipwreck of the 17th century, which is really ground zero for us. At that time, we lost half our population, and the ownership of the land went from 10% English and 90% Irish to 90% English and 10% Irish. But these poets and scribes, reduced to penury and even day laboring as they were, they kept alive the old intellectual order by copying out the medieval manuscripts and therefore saving them from oblivion. And, from, and not just that, just a few, but many others which would have been lost. The work of these men and occasional women um, were often read aloud by the fireside in the hovels of Munster and are partly responsible for the sterling quality of the language that I learned and I heard around me as a child. A language as beautiful and sonorous in Irish as the King James Version of the Bible is in English. And so these are my second great linguistic heroes. But where does the poetry actually come from? If I knew that, I'd bottle it. There is a level of magic involved, something that is the opposite of the triumph of the will, maybe the triumph of the non-will, perhaps. In Irish, it is considered a gift, something that cannot be taught, like, say, a singing voice. In fact, there, there is a triad in modern Irish, and Sírad nach Munter, the three things that cannot be taught, go, féile, agus filiacht, a voice, hospitality, and poetry. It is a duchus, again that word, which more and more in modern Irish has come to mean something like heritage, but actually really means genetic propensity for. You can have a duchus for many things. You can have a duchus for the sea, for horses, for heart attacks. I am supposed to be related to one of the last and greatest of the local poets, Sean O'Dean Lay, 
And both my grandfather on my father's side and my uncle on my mother's side were known to be poets, so I have the duchess. I started writing poetry in boarding school in Limerick. I actually loved the school itself. We had wonderful teachers, mostly nuns, and they were tough enough, but mostly scrupulously fair and devoted, even enlightened teachers. They were on the whole fine intellectual women, Latin, Irish, English, French, geography, chemistry. We got a vigorous training. There was a competition for poetry in the Irish Times, and my music teacher, Mother Veronica Dowling, told me to put a poem in for it. It didn't say which language the poem was supposed to be in, because it was taken for granted that it would be in English. But I, in my total naivety, put in a poem in Irish. It was one out of 10 poems chosen by Charles Monteith, the great English poetry editor, who said he wasn't in a position to make a judgment about my poem as he didn't have Irish, but he was assured by his confreres that it was a good poem. So I went off to college where I did languages, specializing from my second year onwards in Irish and English. I was involved in the group around Michael Davitt and as you have heard, Actually, I was the only woman in the group, and we published the first broadsheet, then magazine, into. We give poetry readings up and down the country, in pubs, in halls. This was way ahead of readings in the English language, um, which were far and few between, and generally very staid events. This was really rock and roll. But in the meantime, something that happened to me that, that drove me to a deeper level, to poetry rather than competent versification. When I was 19, I fell in love and wanted to marry a man who my parents didn't want me to marry. In those days before Ireland had joined the EEC, now EU, you had to get your parents' permission to marry until the age of 21, even though you could vote at 18. My father sent us a letter giving me permission to marry, but in an attempt to force their hand, I went to live with my boyfriend in Crosshaven, County Cork where he was studying the old red sandstones of Munster for his degree in sedimentology. On the Sunday, the 10th of August in 1971, my parents, eight uncles with a stick, burst into the room where we were staying, beat me up, beat him up, kidnapped me, tying me up with electric flex in the back of the car. They brought me to our house in Kerry where I was regularly stripped and beaten in an attempt to make me renounce my boyfriend. They called him all the names on this earth. He was the head of a drug ring. He consorted with prostitutes. Every calumny you can imagine, all scouted out beforehand by my uncle, who was a priest. I didn't know what they thought they were doing, because I knew though unwell at this time. And I knew it was all lies, filthy lies. So I just stopped eating. What happened now is considered a serious miscarriage of justice. In the deep depression that followed, which I hid as best I could because I knew that all they wanted was for me to be locked up in a lunatic asylum, in the months that followed, my lifelong uh, love of poetry actually meant nothing to me. As Hamlet says, they were just words, words, words. But then I chanced on the American poet John Berryman, whom one of my teachers, the poet John Montague, was espousing. And this is um, one verse from a dream song, number 46. I am outside. Incredible panic rules. People are blowing and beating each other without mercy. Drinks are boiling. Iced drinks are boiling. The worst anyone feels, the worst treated he is. Fools elect fools. A harmless man at an intersection said under his breath, Christ. I felt that someone else had been in this, in this desolate wasteland where I found myself. I learned a lot of these dream songs by heart, and nine months after, I wrote what I think were my first real poems, as opposed to competent verse, the Moore poems, where having learned, among other things, how to use personae from, by, from Berryman, I used the folklore stories told locally about the sovereignty goddess Moore in what I still feel were really my first poems as opposed to competent verse. Then, of course, to cut off my nose to spite my face, I left Ireland in a fit of pique, vowing never to set foot again on its godforsaken, priest-benighted sod. But after a while, I realized I was living in the wrong book. 
I was living in Portraits of the Artist as a Young Man uh, by James Joyce, when the book I should have really been living in was Portrait of the Artist as a Young Woman, which was a different book entirely. So I set out to come back to Ireland and write that book in Irish and in poetry. My first book was published a year later. It's On Dalog Dryan, The Blackthorn Thorn. For me, my book was a thorn. It was witness to the great injustice that had been done to me. If I couldn't talk about it openly, then I could do what Emily Dickinson said, which was, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Then we moved to Dublin and I went to the Department of Folklore at the University of Dublin and it became my source of inspiration. It still is. I'm afraid now I've spent a comparatively long time on the ward of court and the ensuing fracas, but that was because until recently I actually thought that this was what had made a poet of me. Perhaps so. But when I was actually writing this speech, it suddenly dawned on me that the poetry comes from somewhere much deeper, much older. It comes eventually from the period when I was abandoned in West Kerry at the age of five, in a house that I had never been in before, amongst people I had never seen before, except my cousin Betty, and I just liked her. There was no, uh, it was, it, the environment was nearly medieval. No electricity, no running water, no toilets, no hygienic facilities. The women went in the cow house. I don't know where the men went. In a language that I had a certain oral knowledge of, but I couldn't speak. In the evenings, my aunt lowered an Aladdin lamp from a long chain over the table, trimmed the wick carefully, then lit it and raised it up again on the chain. We went to bed with candles, stuck in sand in jam crocks, in case they might overturn and catch fire. And always the cold, cold, cold. I was of the Gaeltacht, but not from the Gaeltacht. Six months later, when my father collected me to bring me over to England for Christmas, we spent a night in his hospital apartment. The nun who was putting me to bed, to my total disgust, in a cot, spoke English. I supposedly turned to my father and said, why is this woman speaking to me in English? Isn't this Ireland? It took me a good while to work out the whys and wherefores of English and Irish, and what do you speak to whom? To whom? Looking back on it all at a distance of 60 years, it strikes me now that you wouldn't do that to a cat or even a dog. Abandon a child with such alacrity, no, not unless you were forced to do so by war or starvation or some other enormous calamity. I think more than anything else, that this was the formative event of my whole life, and that I clung to the language as the only interesting or satisfying thing in the environment. Though I didn't know it at the time, the language and the poetry of the language pulled me through, as poetry has done subsequently again and again in my life. It is my lifeline. Without it, I could not live. And therefore, the decision of the Honoured Committee to honour me with this big new Herbert Award is for me not only an enormous honour, but a ratification and justification of my life's work, writing, as I hope to do, the proof of the existence of a woman's emotional and intellectual existence in the 20th and 21st century in Irish and in poetry. In Ireland, I am mostly under the radar. Proof of this uh, is when this prize was announced, I was contacted immediately by all the Irish language media, TG Cahar, Radio the Gaeltacht, the even BBC Radio Northern Ireland. I wasn't contacted by one single person from the English language media in Ireland. It wasn't even mentioned in the Irish Times until a few weeks later when the Irish language writer, Alan Titley, wrote an article in English about this fact, making the point that this was proof, if further proof were needed, that to this day, literature in Ireland still means liter literature in English only. I hope I haven't bored you too much with all the history and personal history I've given you here, but I want above all to adver advertise the fact that by giving me this prize, you have honored a long and often occluded literary tradition. This prize has not only helped me financially, but has given me the courage to continue 
up and at it for what I hope is my last hurrah. My health has been quite bad over the last year and what with my husband's death four years ago, I was beginning to feel it was all over. Inspiration had fled. I was an old woman. It was time to be a falum on Vosch, learning death. You have thankfully proved me wrong. I thank you with all my heart. Gurivmile Mile Mahagav. Congratulations. Uh, thank you for what you've said. We'll now be listening to your poems. If you'll take a seat, uh, this is a theater, so a bit of stage directions. Uh, the outstanding actress who uh, couldn't make it, Maya Komorowska, said, mm, let me read this poem. So we consented. This uh, actress is uh, Maya Komorowska, and the poem is Obad, translated by Jerzy Jarniewicz. Dla świtu to wszystko jedno, na co dnieje na sroczą awanturę w liściach wysokich drzew, na zieloną kaczkę tego dandysa z mokradeł i jej stylowe glisando wśród trzcin, na kurkę wodną, której biała halka trzepocze ponad stawem, na poławiacza ostryk brodzącego pod odpływ. Dla słońca to wszystko jedno, nad czym wschodzi, nad oknami kamienic georgiańskich placów, nad nalotem hord pszczelich na ogrody przedmieścia, nad parami kochanków, którzy nim zrobią to znowu unisono ziewają, nad rosą jak krople potu albo łzy na liliach i różach nad nagością Twoich ramion. Ale dla nas to nie wszystko jedno, że noc dobiega końca, że muszą nam wystarczyć dzisiejsze zdarzenia, że musimy schylić się, zebrać i posklejać te liche skorupy naszego tu życia, żeby nasze dzieci piły wodę z potłuczonych dzbanków a nie z dłoni złożonych w miseczkę. To wcale nie wszystko jedno. Uh, that was Obad, and now let's uh, listen to Nola reading her poems. Kesht na tangam. Kurim mogochus er snav imodin tangam. Fe mor lag van nianan iglevan. A vech fitte furte de yeloga felastrum. Is bitumen ex pick ve kimelte lenda hoin. An son a lag a she si masten an galkach. Is kugel na man a she le thev na hawen. Fechent netherish kadurig an strahe. Fechent, dolle wish, an vorig inin orin. O bad. Is come a lesson widen, kader en yalanchi. Er na kogane a brain se gakran in sna kreen yelokache. Er a mordel glass a snav gatostalach a masna yelkach in sna karahe. Er honin bon an hirki nishka gobinisis and bald perthig, a relioga shulga kuramuk, her fran of ore. Is come a lishing green, kadere yarinche, 
And the two brick here in yoga, the Gunil Snitches Gyarha, a Gyarnoga Shorshaka, and the Sahi Bach, a Gulavu, and Krach, a Yenever Gordini, Brook Valter, a Lamu Noga Fos, a man for a good tune, is Funa Guplala, a Gary Nusanta, a Groch, the Glistner Nock, and the Yora Wor, a Liliana Saroshna, er the Gwilna. Achni Kamalin Gwilani, a rare heart. Is Gagafer Glacale Pera the Hyolig and Law and Yovantli. Gagafer Imach the Scrumashi Sarisht is Pisi Briga Brausanta or Sail, a Glohulik Hale, or Kama Egan, Kungar Fader Lenar Lenni, Ishgagol as Bauli Brishte, in Nunad Asamasa, Ni Kama Linne E. On Crown. The Honig Bamalasa, Le Black and Decker, the Yarshi and the Wasma Crown. Dana Simonja Fierhunterhe, for the Varabshi and the Branchy Kown or Kown. Honig Mar Kero, while a thrown on a Kmakshan Crown, the Yankov Derogar Nina Kona Dulce. Can I have Nar Stoppishi no Kadestole? Kada Chapoxi da Vinche, Black and Decker, a Gustal Konati, a Gus Crown and Suda Vinishle, a Yaran was the Gardeen. Honig ban the lesser, her nash, her madden. These foes, a game of Rick Fast. Dear Shiram Kadur Markele, Dorzele Kadur Chicken, which a Kadistole is Kadachapoxi da Vagshe, Shoot Black and Decker, Agastal Conati, Agas Crown and Suda Vinishle, a Yarrow and the West Cigar Dean. Oh, Ashisha, that's very interesting. We bame her on very. We cling Leshen Ing. The Larshi Anna Hewn. Well, bin Malasa per bisatale unta habonos cum, hit and torn asma vologus femora yon laske kit no lacaters no by horn, the entem anonia a stacherum a yin whole laxame, grabaregan vi or do na maidenum a sunk a country law. Morabonum is in crown, a ganon slon. Fair. When did the Kadia they count or count? The Rouser is the Vest Lentanach Lea. Could the Hood Spiakli or in Glower, in Necker, let the here is the Hankishur. Is Shul cum Trasna on our Lord or Yesh, Gabon the Lepon can provide Desh, Mohu Lahina, her and Neve Doraka, it Knas, her and the Mirulti is all your day at the Kaul. Is Nobby Grud no Girish Lemonoth, no fear of Dim Kemkri, no Brustigart. Take nach lu a yeta me viena shed the ya nocht, mahu le liena na yeta guna art. A year a talk ho fada as the yerg, ho lahan as the goelen is the hev, fang a fun firen, o vahaska bere ungen, is the val faraga cum her da reir, bokor gamorvito o score and tlua, gum run for earth crave is proga oar, bokor gasnifito e the yell of marmor. A chasse of room, it felt is where the door. Don de Velissa. My first in fune, a rink, a green, a dee, ribbing it down, is funny or a de verente. Ditch and a will foes, a quick no shade of lente, teal a cum, a will sit down, mean. Mean. On Garco Ain, a lame testo in the nidder, on Felistrum, a peaca in the dirk, on Perton Glass, a shoe of your scout and yetter, is Latsa yet, let Thort Venera, a name. Beckon Dav, a sugra, lish a mother alta, on Neonon, a glacus, lish a naherni, Leah on loan, she slish an oan quairach, so down or no, a runhin heart, mean, mean. Vec gethi an gardin ar lehag amach is gudianach. Ni vec clitil lastrach o aire e cerebin. Ni ar gaga dilur fige mor naprun eachter. Sa daun ur nu a vran hyn arth. Mean, mean. Sa inin vaan, sa derevu o da vartin. Ga merim ar lawit an yalach as an gireen. Is ga shasan lem car pain ir ar gaga vro an willin. In will to day, chan a melfi tu. Mean, mean. Mean. 
Movile Store. I dus mahel the valish me draw moige tri movige. Higish gemak of yet fi machana hasse, la trocht er hurtena el dacha, er kolog a sucker e gultena the clue of lachen, er lavini the krikanesk. On Sunday, me share board linger, Chris Mavilis Lawn, the Quinney. Chris Suess le Brian is le Barra Ogach Pev. Be Traum, Govietan Mohar de Horev, Erverente and Lava Wine, Achbohomer. Hogish would course and pale is Dilish of Alle, Horning the Lung, the Deer and Malabar. Clue the Islam Milhu is Knock or of the Gruig, Fak the Lea is Deerach. Fos em Queenie. Tandu Bakalach, Tago Hohan Diag, I the Hul Bui Kas. And now the last poem, which is uh, for the um, for my inspiration, my cause of inspiration, which is the, the, the perfect reader, who maybe is a fiction of my imagination, but it doesn't matter. Tusa Is Tusa Pehu Hain? On Firain, a hura clush le hastuk bader the vanin's just scale, a hugna cossa le regan o lard and caha. Near Hugamar fain and sour a lin, no an gira. Near Huelamar are bordling a gomerica, no a loragar of artune le kailish leer be, in snatir her toe, her lar. Near Yamar the varn, a gnock her hap a lauder all in dove. Near Leah Murphy Crown Cairn is an Eha Kor Krishna. Near Lu Namar of a Queen Tinta Knob is an Ark or Shader Hem the Grainy. Adderin, the Anarika Vor, a Thaw Bronach. Adderin, the Naknik is Nishlater. Na Kassen, Eric Hale. Grimmie Marker. And having spoken so much um, and tried to sing, but here you, now you're going to hear a real singer. Uh, this is Eili Schnichnede, whose repertoire is uh, the, the songs that I grew up with, uh, the Auroi Novur and the Moon, the great classical songs of Munster, and who is uh, from my part of the world, uh, uh, um, from the Dingle Peninsula. And I found out recently that her husband and my brother were great um, conspirators uh, in the days of their wasted youth down in Trinity College. And so I would love um, to have uh, Eilish Nikineda come and you will hear the type of song that I was talking about. Thank you very much. <laughs> I did bring my glasses just in case. I'm going to start with the song that you referenced a few moments ago because I've been trying to sing outside and they told me they could hear me, so sorry about that. <clears throat> <clears throat> Can of spray Scandalous, 
I did learn a little phrase of Polish, but of course now I can't remember it, now that you're all in front of me. Um, the next song is a, a song which is a lament for a, a stately home, I suppose you could call that, uh, or an estate called Kilichash, which is in County Tipperary, much beloved of, of Nola. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the song is a lament for, I suppose, a way of life as well as the estate. And it's really, the first line of the song is, Cad yanamid fest the ganaimud, ta dead in the guilt er lor. What will we do without the forests or the wood, the woodlands? The end of the woodland is nigh. And it's not a, an eco-warriors eco song, really. It's talking about the Gaelic way of life. And uh, it represents, I suppose, the cutting down of people's beliefs and their ways of life. And this particular estate was a refuge, I think, is that right, Nola, for priests and poets and more uh, during its lifetime in the, in the mid 1600s, I suppose. The song itself is later uh, and uh, it laments a time gone past. And a, the particular woman involved in the song, uh, she was the lady of the house and she was very sympathetic to the Catholic cause. Uh, during penal times. So um, it's a song that I think everybody learned in school. That's what Nola was mentioning a while ago. And uh, if you are of a persuasion to sing along, don't be shy. I think a few of you in the front row might know it. Uh, much to my shame, I did bring the words with me because uh, there's quite a few of them. <coughs> so it's called Kilchash. It's not quite as long as the introduction. Kadien the meat fast the gun I moot, the dead and the guild her lor. Neil trough their heel hash no tailoch, sneakling for clang of roch. On la toot and the gone hand even, for gradum snyder her Early tarring tar tine, son of a dumbin or Nichlin, who am lachin' no 
This next song is related to that one. Same time period, but this is about a particular person as opposed to a, a place. And uh, again, it should be something. There was a, a song. There was a songbook, wasn't there? No, that our own Laura O'Grady, because the story of the Harona, and a lot of the songs were in that. And uh, there's many verses in this song, but my grandmother always told us that three verses was enough in any song. I don't know if she was right or not. But this is about a man called Sean O'Deed, and he would have fought in his uncle's, I guess, uh, unit during the time of the Cromwellian Wars. And again, it's a lament for a time gone past and uh, for, a, I suppose, a brave man called Sean O'Dear, John Dwyer of the Glen. And I presume the Glen is uh, the Glen of Aherlow, which is a beautiful part of Ireland. It's not Kerry, but it is beautiful. <coughs> Er my dear, er my dear, Slough 
could give is an ishtonghilayarashiel meet our color is a Thank you very much. I'm going to play a tune for you now. It's, uh, it wasn't an originally in the plan, but it became part of the plan today. This may have been a good idea or a bad idea, so I need to fetch my flute. This is a tune um, called Our On The Lower, The Song of the Books. And it's about a boatload of books that unfortunately fell into the sea. They were belonged to a poet. And obviously they were very precious. So I need to make a little bit of noise first. Excuse me.
Thank you. Slanja. <clears throat> it's just water, don't worry. I was making a joke earlier on, but... So the next um, song is a love song. Um, it's a lovely song. Many of the love songs, I'm sure Nuala has explained to you, were patriotic songs. Uh, but this one is a genuine, I think, love song called Jimmy Mavila's Thor. <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's just one of my favourite songs, actually. So I'm delighted that Nuala loves it as well. <clears throat> and if you're called Jimmy, it's for you. Blend on the cushion, we go on room with life. Neo Cheval, go to Rusha Kurs on the Agus cludo The next one is also a song that very much is associated with West Kerry, called In Neen On Eat On Laun. And uh, the woman in the song is the object of the man's affections. And uh, her father's name was Mr. White. So In Neen On Eat, it means Mr. White's daughter from the Glen. And uh, she really is a beautiful woman. And he's praising her so much in all the verses, as you would do. In a love song. Shulach it speak washoch Ganski ganska ganfuarum Tohni ayarit auregan Oh, 
We'll do another love song. This one is called Maureen Debarra. <clears throat> There's not that many. Uh, most of the love songs, uh, I guess, are written from one point of view. Um, this one is a love song called Maureen Debarra and uh, our little Mary Barry, as some of the old songbooks describe it. Um, again, this, I think the words of this song are probably the most beautiful of all the love songs. Uh, it's so genuine. And it could have been written in any age, and I suppose that's the beauty of those of those Shano songs. <clears throat> so as I said, if you're deeply in love with somebody, you might at the moment think about them. That's what I'm doing anyway. <laughs>
Thank you very much, and uh, let's enjoy this meeting. Let's enjoy this lovely evening. Let's uh, relish the presence of Elish and Nula, and uh, let's uh, 
Join us in the lobby where you will be able to buy books by Nola. We have her publisher and she'll be signing autographs, I'm told. Thank you very much and see you soon. Bye.